Welcome to our study this week of Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 22 to 36. My name is Scott Rainey. I serve with the Church of the Nazarene in the area of Nazarene Discipleship International, or NDI. This adult Sunday school video lesson is provided in collaboration between the Foundry Publishing and NDI. The Sunday school lesson is intended to support the local church's efforts to make disciples who make disciples. Please feel free to use this video in any way that helps your church or its families. As we begin our lesson from Ezekiel 36, I want to review a little history to put our scripture for this week in context. King Saul began as Israel's first king around 1020 BC. That date symbolizes the year God's people went from being a people group to being a nation. Soon after the death of King Solomon, Israel's third king, around 930 BC, the nation of Israel was broken into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, called Israel, with its capital in Samaria, and the southern kingdom, called Judah, with its capital in Jerusalem. In 722 BC, Samaria fell to the Assyrian forces, and the northern kingdom of Israel ceased to be a kingdom, and the Israelites of the northern kingdom who survived were taken into captivity. 136 years later, in 586 BC, Jerusalem was also destroyed by the Babylonian forces, and the remaining Jewish people from the southern kingdom were taken into exile in Babylon. At the time of Israel's destruction in 586 BC, it would have been easy for someone, someone without faith in God and without faith in God's messages through the prophets, to conclude that God's grand experiment with the, with the Hebrew people was finished. Any fulfillment of God's promises to the ancestors of Abraham was no longer to be ex expected. Hope seemed dead. Let me just speak a word of faith and truth as we get started today. God is always resurrecting the dead. In Ezekiel 36, we will find hope in the wonderful God of grace. Israel, it seemed, would one day be resurrected from the grave and return to the abundant life in the land of Israel. 500 years later, God would raise Jesus, his one and only son, from the grave. For the past 2,000 years, God has been raising people from spiritual death to new life in Christ. And one day, in the future still to come, God will raise those who have died in Christ to everlasting life. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The question for today is how would God restore Israel as a people and as a nation? What would that restoration look like? To answer these questions, let's read Ezekiel 36, verses 22 to 36. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will serve you from all your uncleanness. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful 
and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds, and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares a sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgraced for your conduct, people of Israel. This is what the sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say the land was laid waste, has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. The nation of Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdoms, had represented God very poorly among the nations of the world. In Ezekiel 36, verse 22, God said, You have profaned my name among the nations where you have gone. To profane means to disrespect it. In a religious sense, it is to make something secular rather than holy. The people of Israel and Judah, by their rebell rebelliousness, had taken God's name and made it secular, not holy. In Jewish thought, the name of someone represented their character or reputation. Now, objectively, God's name or God's character does not depend on the character or action of God's people. God is good, righteous, and holy by himself. However, subjectively, the behavior of God's people can negatively reflect on God in the eyes of others watching. Think for a moment with me what the people of the surrounding nations must have thought of Yahweh when they watched the life of the people of Israel. They may have thought, is this the way the people who follow Yahweh behave? Then remember that God had given the land of Israel to his people. Now God had removed the same people from this land by the hand of enemy armies. To the onlooker from surrounding nations, God became viewed as just another man-made deity like the ones that other nations worshiped. Few people saw any benefit in serving the God of Israel because of what they saw in his people. Sin in the community of faith had made the Lord look bad. So God in Ezekiel 36 revealed that he was going to change things through the transformation of his people from the inside out. In doing so, his name would be honored by all nations. And according to verse 23, the nations will know that he is the Lord. The phrase, they will know I am the Lord, is repeated throughout the book of Ezekiel over 30 times. The Hebrew word translated know conveys the idea of personally experiencing God, not just knowing about God. When God transforms his people, Israel, the other nations will be open to a personal experience with the one true God. Our world desperately needs to know who the Lord truly is. His holy name must be proclaimed so that people can comprehend his unique and incomparable character. There is no one like God in the universe. He is the only source of salvation and real life for the people of this world. Notice that God's expressed desire is bigger than just Israel, though. God sought to transform Israel in order that the nations will know, verse 23. The transformation of Israel 
would bring hope that others might truly experience a relationship with the Lord as well. God's desire has always been bigger than one nation. Looking back to God's first call to Abram, the father of the Jewish faith, God said, all nations on earth will be blessed through you. Genesis 12, verse 3. I remember when I attended Nazarene Theological Seminary, instructor after instructor reminded the students that the end result of our spiritual formation was not for us, but for others. We are formed in Christ so that others might believe and have life too. Ezekiel's message in Ezekiel 36 verses 24 to 27 lays out the process God planned for transforming his people. The process of restoration would begin by God taking the people of Israel out of the nations where they had were scattered and bringing them back to the promised land, verse 24. Consider this for a moment. All throughout history, people or portions of people have emigrated or been carried away captive from their own lands. No people had ever returned to the land of origin, whether their leaving was voluntary or involuntary. And it's difficult, even still today, to think of any people's return since Ezekiel's day, except for the Hebrew, Israelite, Judean, Jewish people. You see, God had promised this land to his people, and he would deliver it in his time and in his way. Of course, God's promise was fulfilled first in the initial Jewish return, enabled by the edict of King Cyrus of Persia, beginning around 539 BC. The second Jewish return to Israel, and possibly the end times phase in God's fulfillment of this promise, began about 130 years ago and continues today in 2023 as the Jewish people who were scattered continue to return to Israel. Today, Israel is home to around 40% of the world's Jews. To date, there is no other example in human history of a nation being reestablished after such a long period of existence as a scattered people in other lands. Let me mention here that this leaving of other nations behind and returning to the land of God's promise certainly makes us think of spiritual things as well. God's people needed to separate themselves from the corrupting influences around them and return to the, to the place God designed for them to live. When people come back to God today, they must be willing to be taken out of friendships and activities that do not represent God's way. We call this repentance, which means to turn away from one way toward another way. And like it was in the case of the exiled Israelites, this kind of turning away is only possible by God's power and God's grace. The second step of restoration, according to Ezekiel 36, is that the Lord would cleanse his people verse 25. You might remember from our earlier lessons that Ezekiel was a priest in training when he was 25 years old in Jerusalem before the exile to Babylon. In the Levitical instruction, the difference between clean and unclean is critically important, and Ezekiel would have known this well. Priests used the term to cleanse to speak of actions that prepared them to enter God's presence in the temple. Fully aware of God's awesome holiness, Israel's priests regularly washed their hands, changed their clothes, abstained from things so that they might be acceptable in God's sight. Three times in verse 25 alone, God uses the word cleanse. This should strike us with the measure of the importance God attaches to the cleansing and purity of God's people. The presence of impurities and idols indicate that God does not hold first place in someone's life. They must be removed by the cleansing of God's spirit. Theologically, we talk about God's cleansing at the moment of salvation 
with the term justification. The idea of justification is that in one moment, we are made clean, just as if we had never sinned. The third phase of restoration as God's people is what we might refer to as a heart transplant. Look at verse 25. This third phase is incredibly significant. Let me explain. If cleansing is all there is, unending cleansing would be required. You, you clean a plate and the plate gets dirty again. There is an ancient rabbinic theory that puts humanity's inclination to evil in permanent opposition to humanity's inclination to good. In this view, we will never escape the struggle between the two inclinations. While there is truth in the fact that in this world, as we await Christ's second coming, we will always need to choose in our free will the good choices over the bad choices we encounter. We can, however, be forever grateful that God gives us more, even in the here and now, than unending, uncertain, unaided moral struggle. Even greater than the cleansing in God's, is God's removal of our heart of stone and putting within us both the heart of flesh and God's spirit. If cleansing has some connection to justification, then we might say that this new heart and new spirit is connected to regeneration. The idea of regeneration is that God's Holy Spirit enters the new believer and enables him or her to follow God in a way that was beforehand not possible. This is exactly what God described in Ezekiel 36, verse 27. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. As Wesleyans, we call this initial sanctification. God, through his spirit, changes the new believer from the inside out. Christ himself chastised the Pharisees for trying to clean up the outside of the cup while the inside of the cup or the heart remained dirty. Christ came as the ultimate fulfillment of this heart transplant to make the new heart possible in the power of the spirit. The sanctified believer may experience both temptations and trials, but life need be neither a ceaseless nor an overwhelming struggle. Thanks be to God, there is victory. The word order in the original Hebrew of Ezekiel 36, 27, makes it clear where this strength comes from. A direct translation would be, and my spirit I will put in you. The focus is on God's spirit. Our commentator for this week's lesson said, transformed hearts lead to transformed lives, which in turn lead to a transformed world. You see, a changed heart changes all of life. As we look at this last section of scripture, Ezekiel 36, verses 28 to 36, we can see three things that result from Israel's transformed hearts. The first result of a transformed heart is a renewal of the intimate covenant relationship with God. Verse 28 says, you will be my people and I will be your God. God would once again call Israel my people, and they would know the Lord as their God. In the Hebrew, the form of the pronoun I in verse 28 is not the usual form, but what is called an emphatic form. We might think of it as saying, you will be my people, and I, even I, Yahweh, will be your God. Once again, all of this is possible because of God, his initiative, his power. The covenant relationship is restored to the way God intended it to be from the beginning of time. Did you know that you can be restored into a relationship with your creator that's defined by the way he intended it to be? Think Garden of Eden. We'll come back to that. The second result of a transformed heart is that people would regain things lost in the past life of sin. Here, there's a seamless bonding of the physical and spiritual in God's wonderful economy. 
the renewed people of God would experience blessing upon the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field once more. Verse 30, abandoned towns would be resettled and ruins rebuilt. Verse 33, they would rebuild life in the promised land until it began to look like what God had originally designed for them, like the Garden of Eden. Verse 35, where God and his humans and humans first experienced intimate fellowship. Consider the difference described in a life without God versus a life with God. Without God, ruins, desolate, laid waste, and destroyed. With God, resettled, cultivated, like the Garden of Eden fortified, inhabited, rebuilt, and replanted. The third result of a transformed heart is that the nations would take notice. Verse 36, people would begin to see the kind of life that only the Lord can give. As a result, Israel would be a witness to the world of who the Lord truly is, a gracious God, transformed people. Reflecting their transforming God is attractive to a broken and hurting world. Our passage for this week ends with these words from verse 36. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. God has fulfilled this prophecy. God has made it possible for you and for me to return to the covenant relationship he desires to have with each of us. He has made it possible through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. His blood, by his blood, we can be cleansed. Through his spirit, we can receive a new heart. By his grace, our life can be a temple where God's spirit can dwell. And in the end, God promises blessings for eternity. Who would ever reject such a promise? Come to Jesus, all of you who are weary and tired, and he will give you rest today.